Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Compasso. Today, Syria's president, Bashar al-Assad, has arrived in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, to attend the Arab League summit. This is a big deal because uh, the Arab League had shunned uh, President Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, due to their allegiance to the radical Wahhabi uh, groups that opposed him. That is to say that countries like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Jordan, uh, also Turkey, which is not an Arab country, but uh, Turkey did uh, support uh, Arab, uh, sorry, uh, Islamist groups that opposed the Baathist government of Syria, right? And now there has been this rapprochement uh, since the American power vacuum in the Middle East. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates especially have been very eager to make peace uh, or uh, stabilize their relationships with uh, former adversaries. That is to say, for example, Iran with Chinese mediation and now as of late with Syria. And this is a very important uh, event for Syria because, first of all, opening up the ties will, you know, hopefully bring in some investment in the country. Uh, these countries that actually invested in Syria's destruction uh, can now uh, invest in their economy and uh, Syria is in dire need of that. Uh, especially after the war, but also on top of that, you have the Caesar Act sanctions, which is crippling the uh, the economy in Syria and is and is making life harder for the average Syrian. And that's the whole point of sanctions: that is to starve out populations, so they will get tired of their government and overthrow it in a preferably in a violent coup, right? Because the U.S. empire want to see, and their Israeli proxy, want to see countries that oppose them in chaos. They don't want to see them flourish. So, uh, obviously, the reaction from D.C. and the United States was negative. Uh, they claim they want a political solution first to the Syrian conflict, and then they can, then uh, Bashar al-Assad can sort of come or not come to the uh, Arab League summit. But the Saudis said, fuck it, we don't care. We're going to bring them in anyway. And uh, yeah, Bashar al-Assad received a very warm welcoming. Um, maybe we can read a little bit of the article, and this is the Reuters article. Uh, it says here, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad was given a warm welcome at an Arab summit on Friday, winning a hug from Saudi Arabia's crown prince at a meeting of leaders who had shunned him for years in a, sh in a shift policy, in a policy shift opposed by the U.S. and other Western powers. And this goes to show you that the Western powers don't want peace in the Middle East. They always want to sow chaos and ferment chaos in this region so they can partition countries according to the Odin Yunnan plan. Uh, doesn't mean they will always succeed, but at least keep them in a uh, chaotic state, basically, so they can pretty much rob these uh, these countries blind. But anyway, uh, Assad long ostracized by Arab states as he turned the tide of serious civil war with Russia's help, was joined at the summit by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who wants to build support for Kiev's battle against Russian invaders. By the way, uh, the, uh, the Syrian government is fully behind uh, the Russian SMO, which is no surprise because they helped them to destroy a, a, a lot of these uh, rabid radical uh, Isl Islamist groups. So, Gulf states have tried to remain neutral in the Ukraine conflict despite Western pressure on Gulf oil producers to help isolate Russia a fellow OPEC Plus member. Uh, 
Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in a speech said Riyadh stood ready to mediate between Russia and Ukraine, which they did in a prisoner release last year. Uh, and Zelensky also ad addressing the summit asked delegates to support Ukraine's formula for peace, and there you go, thanked Riyadh, uh, Riyadh for its role in mediating a prisoner release last year. Crown Prince Mohammed uh, shook hands with Assad and hugged him before an official picture was taken ahead of the meeting. We hope Syria's return to the Arab League leads to an, to an end of this crisis, Crown Prince Mohammed said in his remarks. 12 years after Arab states suspended Syria as the country descended into civil war that has killed more than 350,000 people. And let's remember that this was a Western imposed war on Syria and almost 110 countries uh, supported the, uh, this, the destruction of the country. I mean, the Syrian government only received help from what? perhaps Iran, uh, that was to say Iran and Russia militarily at least, diplomatically by from China. Um, yeah, there's a few other states, Algeria, I think North Korea, and, and that's about it. And uh, so Syria has had tremendous difficulties, uh, gone through a lot of suffering, so yeah. Oil powerhouse Saudi Arabia, once heavily influenced by the United States, has taken the diplomatic lead in the Arab world in the past year, re-establishing ties with Iran, welcoming Syria back to the fold, and uh, mediating in the Sudan conflict. Washington has objected to any steps, as I said, towards normalization with Assad, saying there must be f must first be progress towards a political solution to the conflict. The Americans are dismayed. We Gulf states are people living in this region. We're trying to solve our problems as much as we can with the tools available to us in our hands, said a Gulf source close to government circles. Here's what I think is going to happen, uh, and I've spoken about it before. I think the, the Russians uh, are going to help mediate peace between uh, Turkey. There's going to be a rapprochement between Turkey and Syria. And when that happens, Turkish forces are going to leave uh, northern Syria. And the Arab countries have made peace with Syria as well. So effectively, this leaves the uh, American soldiers that are in northeast Syria isolated. And therefore, they will also be uh, brought out of Syria sooner or later. Sorry about that. And um, then you have Idlib, the issue of Idlib. What's going to happen to the approximately 40,000 uh, Al-Qaeda fighters that are stuck there? That's hard to tell, but... I think that Turkey will have to probably be forced to take them in uh, and I don't know exactly what they're going to do with them to be honest with you. Are they going to use them in some proxy war somewhere or are they going to send them back to their respective countries? These people or will the Syrian government imprison them or grant them amnesty? This is a, 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 a difficult task uh, that will, will have to be discussed. So uh, yeah, uh, let's go down. Uh, one highly sensitive issue is Assad's close ties to the Iranians, which makes Arab states uneasy. A Gulf analyst told Reuters that Syria risked becoming a subsidiary of Iran and asked, do we want Syria to be less Arab or more Iranian? Or to come back to the Arab fold? Now, this is a... sensitive contingent perhaps but i think it's kind of ridiculous that syria is going to be iranified or some sort in some sort of a way yes there are schools in syria from what i've heard um, that teaches the farsi or persian language basically that's not a sign 
that Syria is getting, quote unquote, Persianized or Iran Iranianized. Uh, majority of Syrians are not going to convert to Shiaism. Absolutely not. Uh, but trade will probably increase. I mean, if you exchange culture and language, that's a good thing. Um, and secondly, let's be fair here. Historically speaking, most of these Arab countries that are in the Arab League have always conspired against Syria. Syria and Iran have been friends since almost the revolution, pretty much, uh, in Iran since 1979. Uh, and uh, most Arab countries have been conspiring against any revolutionary or nationalist government in the region, doing the bidding of Washington. So, to me, it's... Yeah. To me, it's like... How, how do you have the nerve to even say that? But anyway, having welcomed back Assad, Arab states want him to reign in Syria's flourishing drugs trade in exchange for closer ties. Alongside the return of millions of refugees who fled Syria, the Captagon trade has become a big worry for Arab leaders, on par with concern about the foothold of established, the foothold established by Shiite Islamist Iran in the Arab country. Uh, something that catched me here. Uh, the refugees. Yes. I think this... I don't think a lot of refugees are going to go back to Syria. Uh, I think a few will. But uh, when you... But a lot of Syrians have pretty much established their life here already. And... Uh, Highly educated Syrians especially. I mean, they make more money here than they would do ba back home. And uh, because Western countries have imposed sanctions on Syria, right? They can't transfer their money back to their country. And one thing I have a problem with a lot of these Zionist fascist parties in the West, such as the Sweden Democrats or other similar parties uh, is that they destroy these countries they have no problem a lot of times with military intervention in these countries but they often talk about we're going to make sure that the refugee is going to return we can help them financially and so forth how are you going to do that when you have sanctioned their banking system if i have worked here let's say as a syrian i have made all my money I have saved a lot of money. I have invested in a pr property or real estate or something. How are you going to make sure I can take this money with me back to Syria? I think that's a legit question. I think a lot of Syrians should go back because brain drain, basically, right? I think they should contribute to the development of their country. Um, you know, I think they should go back and rebuild Syria, right? But if you make it harder for them to return, if you do the bidding of Israel and the United States, it's not going to make the, the process uh, even... Uh, it's not going to make it easier. Don't get it twisted. These people don't care about brain drain or developing Syria or whatever. They care about, you know, and a, a pure ethno state and all that stuff. But my point still remains. <clears throat> anyway, um, I kind of lost myself here. Okay, uh, the war has shattered Syria's economy, demolishing infrastructure, cities, and factories. Assad would no doubt benefit from Gulf investments in his battered country, though U.S. sanctions complicate any commercial ties with Damascus. The Arab rapprochement with Assad gained momentum after China negotiated an agreement in March that saw Riyadh assume diplomatic, resume diplomatic ties with Iran, which with Russia has helped Assad defeat Sunni rebels and regain control of some major cities. I hope you guys know the major consequences of what would have happened if these Sunni rebels, quote-unquote, 
I don't really like to refer him to because a lot of a majority of Bashar al-Assad's army is Sunni Muslim. Uh, majority of their victims have been Sunni Muslim. So I I'm, I don't want I don't like to paint it as if like this is the core of Sunni Islam. But I'm trying to say is uh, these Wahhabi uh, groups, if they would have had destroyed the Syrian government, its institutions, and grabbed power, I mean, we would have seen, like, genocide on a whole new other level, you know, because they would have ethnically cleansed, uh, you know, Christians and Alawites, uh, Druze people, uh, Jews, uh, you name it. Uh, that is to say Jewish Syrians, not uh, the Israelis. Uh, the, the Israelis would probably contain them in some way or form, but Israel was actually very happy with the way things were going in Syria. In fact, uh, Syria, uh, sorry, Israel had been conducting a lot of air sorties, bombardments in Syria, a thousand plus of them, which helped a lot of these uh, Wahhabi rebel groups to conduct their operations. So basically, Israel was their air support, uh, more or less. And uh, even Israel's former defense minister, I believe, he said that he rather wants a, a ISIS-controlled Syria than Bashar al-Assad because they want to surround Iran. The whole point of attacking Syria, right, or one of the major points at least, was to stick it to Iran, make sure that Iran loses allies, that it becomes isolated in the region and eventually prepare maybe an attack against uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran as well, right? So that was one of the goals with Syria, at least. And obviously uh, to get rid of any anti-Zionist adver adversary uh, in, in the Middle East uh, that, is, that are still left. So, um, but yes, a large swath of Syria, however, remains under Turkish-backed rebels and radical Islamist groups, as well as, U as, as a U.S.-backed Kurdish militia. Now let's talk about that Kurdish militia. Because what they're doing in Syria is absolutely illegal. They're occupying the most fertile lands, the most resource-rich lands. I'm not talking about Kurdish people. I'm talking about these specific militia groups. The YPG, the Syrian Democratic Forces, that is to say, which is not solely Kurdish, by the way. There is it's kind of mixed. There are some Arab elements and 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 Turkmen elements, I believe, or whatever. But uh the core of it is is, is Kurdish, I believe, right? And what does this effectively do? Yeah, you pretty much starve out the rest of the country from agricultural lands and food and energy. That's a criminal act. And the Kurds or the Kurdish groups, so to speak, the Kurdish political establishment have had high hopes that allying themselves with the United States would help them in their mission to sort of create a Kurdish state in Syria or a autonomous state, which is ridiculous. The United States and the West always uses Kurds when it's in their benefit and when they no longer need them, they toss them to the side. That's how it historically it has been uh, in the Middle East when you look at it throughout history. And uh, it amazes me every time that the Kurdish leadership in, for example, Syria or maybe Iraq uh, still have this very pro-American uh, stance, okay? And obviously the, the Israelis are heavily invested in, uh, heavily invested in, in helping or supporting uh, both the Kurdish regional government in northern Iraq as well as the YPG in, in, uh, in Syria. But anyway, uh, finding a political solution to the 12-year-old conflict remains a big dilemma for Arab and Western countries. According to the UNHCR, since 2011, more than 14 million Syrians have been forced to flee their homes. 
around 6.8 million Assyrians remain in internally displaced in their own country where 90% of the population live below the poverty line. And again, a lot of this is also tied to the sanctions. The sanctions doesn't make, the li make life easier for the average Syrian. About 5.5 million Syrian refugees live in five neighboring countries, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. And may I add, they live in very dire conditions. Uh, chemical weapons. Assad is due to speak later on Friday. The Syrian state news agency said Qatari Emir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani shook hands with Assad, though there was no immediate confirmation of that in Qatari media. In 2018, the Qatari Emir said that uh, said the re region could not tolerate a war criminal like Assad. Qatar hosted an Arab summit a decade ago at which the Syrian opposition sat in Syria's seat. Ahead of the summit, the U.S. State Department reiterated opposition to normalization of relations with Damascus and said sanctions should not be lifted. But State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel added that we have a number of shared objectives such as bringing home Austin Tice, a former U.S. Marine and journalist who was kidnapped in Syria in 2011. The U.S. President Donald Trump branded an animal for using chemical weapons in 2018, a weapon he co consistently denied using. Assad rarely left Syria after the war began, going only to Iran and Russia until 2022. When he visited the United Arab Emirates, his first trip to an Arab country since 2011. I think one day we have to make a recap of the uh, Syrian, uh, the imperialist war on Syria. Because the whole chemical weapons thing was a bunch of nonsense that they used to justify bombardment and further escalation against the Syrian people and government. And they used the white helmets, which was created by a British MI6 agent, by the way, who killed himself, jumped out of a balcony in Turkey, right? His death is very suspicious, by the way. Uh, even the, um, what's it, I think the UN organ, what's it called? When it, uh, OECD or something? I don't remember, but... Yeah, even if I remember it correctly, they had a lot of, uh, uh, they doubted a lot of things about the so-called chemical attacks uh, that they accused Bashar al-Assad of. And I find it funny that every time the Syrian Arab army was making progress in the battlefield, this accusation and these scripts would often come out and they would accuse the Syrian Arab army for uh, for doing this and uh yeah i mean the the rebel groups that fought in syria would often commit human rights violations and then blame that on the syrian arab army uh some of their heinous crimes or a lot of them were actually filmed um uh, one islamist group Jaish, was it Jaish al Islam? I don't remember, but it was a takfiri group nonetheless. Uh, they, for example, filmed when they beheaded a 10 year old Palestinian refugee, uh, refugee boy. And uh, so this is the type of people that the West support, including Sweden, by the way. The, the Swedish government had sent around like 110 million Swedish kronor. To, uh, to the Syrian opposition, not its armed wing, but to its political wings, uh, one of its political wings at least. This was like exposed by, uh, by Proletaren and then republished in uh, Aftonbladet. Strangely, I don't think you can find that article anymore in Aftonbladet, but yes, Sweden definitely had a role in uh, facilitating or maybe supporting m m rather uh, the political wing of the uh, Syrian opposition. Now, how much of that money has gone to arms? That's a good question. Uh, I have no idea about that. But we also allowed a lot of Muslim Brotherhood types 
to get free media access here. Uh, our the media uncritically uh, promoted Syrian opposition uh, sources. Uh, they uh, often talked about these so-called barrel bombs, and uh, yeah, I mean it, it was in, in, yeah it, it was uncritical nonetheless. And like I said before, the the Swedish government, not the Swedish government, but Sweden as a country, had pretty much, you know, tolerated the presence of uh, radical uh, preachers uh, who brainwashed a lot of young people in our, you know, immigrant ghettos, who, yeah, went to Syria to die in a war that they had nothing to do with. So, um, yeah, and some of them survived. Some of them have come back. Uh, there is a fear that some of these people are going to, you know, join their respective gangs because a, a lot of these people that went to Syria from Sweden and uh, Europe in general, they were petty criminals. Uh, now they come back with more, you know, with, with war experience and uh, they constitute a danger to society. But... Uh, yeah, nobody gives a shit, right? That's how it is in this country. But anyway, uh, I'm glad that ties are getting normalized. I hope Syria gets the investment that it needs so it can get out of this economic crisis so people don't have to sacrifice their lives to, you know, flee from the country that they were born and raised in because that got to suck. You know what I mean? That's not fun at all. And... uh a hope for peace and uh, stabilization in in the in the Middle East and Syria in general, uh, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's hope for the best. Thank you, everybody. Like the video, hit the subscription button, and uh, share it. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. And I'm out. Stay blessed.